Hello everyone, I'm Madde and uh, you are watching Tretton Strategi's Wednesday Knowledge Stream. Uh, half of May has already gone. It's uh, crazy, time flies so fast. Uh, yesterday I started counting like how many of these streams have we really done? And I, uh, when I counted, I got it to eight. And I mean, it feels like yesterday that we sat here with Buddha Zewil and did the first stream. And now it's uh, eight weeks later, it's, it's really crazy. Outrageous. We have some streams coming the rest of May. We will have, but uh, after today, we got two more. I will run a PI planning together with my team. So it's a big thing going on. But uh, I have my colleague Andrea Sedström joining, which will um, uh, hand over and present the stream. And I'm sure he will do a great job. Um, but let's not talk too much about the future. Let's talk about today. Um, we're here now um, because um, we're about to listen to some intro to functional programming. And we are here together with my colleague, Johan Olsson, who is a software architect, developer, and a beer enthusiast. So, uh, hi, Johan. Hello. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you right now because my sound is gone. Right, this I works. hear you good. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, how are you, Johan? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. I still can't hear you. This is very interesting. Still no sound. <laughs> but it seems like you can hear me. So this is a very interesting yes, thing. Yes, I can hear you. You don't hear me? Mara? Okay, so there seems to be some technical difficulties. Um, that's always great to have. Uh, I can't hear anyone, but you seem all to hear me. So I say that this is a very interesting uh, introduction to you, Juan. Uh, I'm very happy to have you here. Um, let's not talk too much about this, but I'll say that you, Juan, please continue and uh, start your presentation now. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm here today to talk about functional programming and how you can start use functional programming in your daily work. But first we have to look into what functional programming really is and how it differs from object orienting. And it is another paradigm because functional programming has its roots in mathematics. And while object orienting has its roots in procedural programming or more specifically how a computer works and that's not really mathematics that's something else so there is a difference yes and with functional programming we are doing a lot more declarative and not that much imperative programming and i'm going to show you some some example of that and we separate data from behavior. In object orienting, you have data and behavior, and data and methods in the same package, but we separate those. And that has some implications. I will give you some examples of that as well. We often use data as immutable. That means that data cannot change. Instead of changing data, we create new data. I'm gonna look into that as well. And with functional programming, we really don't want side effects. While object orienting is all about side effects. That is a big difference. And null does not exist in a functional programming world. That has some really big implications, really. 
and we will look into that as well. And functional programming is much about composition, meaning how you put your program together by combining different functions, composing them. Uh, first, we're going to look into declarative versus imperative languages. A declarative language is a language where you declare what your result would look like. Like in SQL, for example, that's a declarative language. I declare, I want the result to look like this. I want the result from table T where some the data confirms to some criteria, where T ID is, and then I can have some, some other declaration. This is what result I want. I don't care or even know how the database does to, to re receive this result, but that's the result I want. Now, hey, computer, go, go figure out how to get my result. Whereas in imperative language, we declare, oh, oh sorry, we do each step for in the C sharp example here, which is a naive implementation of the SQL where we create a list, we iterate over the list, do some ifs and create a new list and iterate over that. And finally, we have a result. So we do this, do that, do this third thing. And then finally, we have a result that is hopefully what we wanted from the beginning. Uh, here's another example. SAML or HTML for that matter. Uh, I declare I have a grid. And inside the grid, there's a button with the content OK on it. That's what I want. That's the UI that I want, how it should look like. Whereas in an imperative language, I would have to create the grid, create the button, set the button content, add the grid, sorry, add the button to the grid. So each step to get what I want. In the left side, when the SAML, I just say, I want a grid with a button inside. I don't care how you do computer, figure it out how to do that. I don't care. That's a big difference. And with function, uh, we separate data from functions. So we have some data, and we have a function that operates on that data. And it creates a new data. Whereas in object orienting, we mix data and functions together. And with uh, polymorphism, this can get quite confusing. I call function one on the class A, but it really wasn't a class A, it was a class B, so I get something else. And that can be quite confusing, whereas the function is, is more straightforward. We have a data and we have a function, that belongs, that the function operates on the data. And we also use immutable data. And that means data cannot change. Instead, when you take some data into your function, you return something else, a new piece of data. And that means your code is more predictable. Put something in, you get something else out. And that means it's more easy to reason about what really happens in this function, what it really does, because there's no side effects and there's no change. You get have data in, data out, that's it. And that makes it easier to work with. You need fewer unit tests. There are no state that has to be set before or no state that has be, to be checked after you, you call them the function. You have the data in, the data out, that's it. And it really forces you to think a bit different because you don't change data, you transform it to something else. So I would like to say that a function does not return data, it produces something new. So you send a something in as a parameter, and the function will produce something else as a return value. This 
also makes concurrency much, much easier. If you have data that cannot change, then I can take one piece of data and give it to that thread. And I can take the same piece of data and give it to another thread. And I don't need to have any synchronization. I don't need no locks or mutex or semaphores or stuff like that. The data cannot change. So the threads can operate on the data, no problems in at the same time. So it makes, makes multi-threading easier. And with functional programming, we talk about impure and pure functions. A pure function always returns the same result with the same input every time we call it. And a pure function also hadn't have no side effects. And with side effects, we mean network calls or IO or creating database calls or reading files or, or changing something. Like if I call a function that reads something from a database, if I call it one more time, then I might get something else because someone else has been adding things to the database in between my calls. So that is not a pure function because it then gives different results. Also, if I print something to screen, I print it to the console. If I call it one more time, then I have two lines on my console, which is not the same thing. So all IOs is impure functions. Now, as functional programmers, we prefer pure functions because they're easier to understand, easier to reason about, but we must have impure functions as well, because a program that does not have any IO is more or less useless. So we must have pure impure functions as well, but we like to minimize how much impure functions we really have. And we have no nulls. Null does not exist. And the null is often referred to the billion dollar mistake. And a function will always take one parameter or more, and it will always return a value. Now, how can we work with that? How can we understand what that really means? To do that, I would like you to consider this. Say we have a two dimensional value space, a two-dimensional coordinate system. One point in this system, one value in it, denoted as x and y, that is a, the input to function f here. So f takes one value, the x and y coordinate. Or you could also say that f takes two parameters, x and y, that's how you choose to see it. If you have a one dimensional value space, just one X axis, then one point in this one dimensional coordinate space is just the X parameter. So the function G here, it takes one parameter, one value. Now, if we have a zero, dimensional value space. And there is a value in there. There is one and only one value in the zero dimensional space. And that value is called unit. So the H function here, it takes one parameter from the zero dimensional value space. It takes unit as it inputs. So every function here takes one parameter. And if we can have unit as an input value, we can have unit as a result from a function as well. Another way we must handle is when we could create different types of return values. And then we must use 
what is called a monad. And a monad is a strange word, but what it really is, is a design pattern. Just as we have some patterns that we use in object orienting to solve different problems, we have patterns in functional programming as well. And monad is one of them. Now, consider this. Say we have a function, a find fu customer function. And if we find the customer, then we should return it. But if we don't find the customer, then what shall we return then? There is no null. And here I have some Elm code. And Elm is a functional programming language. It compiles to JavaScript, and you can run it in the browser. And here, the first line is a function declaration. It declares that we have a function called find customer. It takes string as its input, and it will return something. I will fill that in in just a bit. And the second line, that is the function implementation. It's a find customer. Find customer is the name of the function. Name is the name of the parameter. And as we have declared, that name is a string. Then we do something. We read a database or, or whatever. But what shall we return here if we don't find the customer? Let's look into this. The maybe monad can be uh, expressed in Elm like this. We have a type called maybe with a value. And that is just a value or nothing. You can think of this as an enum. And an enum has two cases. It has just and nothing. That's the two cases of this enum with the added bonus that the just case has an additional value attached. The best thing you could do, or the most equal thing you could do with an object-oriented language would be something like this, where we have an abstract class called maybe, and one concrete implementation called just with a value property and another concrete implementation called nothing. And we will always return either an implementation, either just instance or a nothing instance. That's what the function will return. So we can declare our function like this, find customer, takes string as an input, and returns maybe customer. That's the data type. The implementation will then be find, find customer name equals, and then we do the actual database call. And if we found it, then we will return just customer, else nothing. Think of this as a box. The box may contain a customer, or the box may be empty, but you will always get a box back from this function. This function will always return a box. Then you will have to look into the box to see if you really got a customer or not, but you will always get a box. There is more to the monad pattern than this, but I don't really have time to explain it in detail. But that's the simplest explanation and it's a bit naive, but we'll, let's keep it at that for now. Now, if I want to use the result of the find customer function, let's say I have another function that will get the name, then I take maybe customer as an input to my function, and I return a string. The implementation here, get name, x, x is the, the box, if you will. And here I must look into the box with a case switch and say, if it was just customer, all right, then I can take customer.name to get the name of it. If the case is nothing, 
then I have no name. I can return that string. And the good thing about this is that the compiler requires you to check all cases. You must check the just case, and you must check the nothing case. So you can't have a case where you forget to handle one of these. You must always do it. And the find, find customer function in an object-oriented language is often implemented or typically implemented as if we find the customer, we return it. If not, we return null. And then let the caller handle that null in a way. Here, we can't do that. We must handle. Both. You can't forget to handle the nothing case because the compiler won't let you. So we have effectively moved the null reference exception from runtime to compile time. And the compiler won't let you get away with it, so you must handle it. And there is no null reference exception in a functional language. It can't exist. So this means that a function always returns a value. And you must explicitly declare that you might return a missing value by using the maybe monad or some other construct. And you must explicitly handle all the missing value in, a, in your function input. The compiler won't let you make, make mista mistakes here. And that's a good thing. Now, if we look into composition, and that's how we put functions together to build a program. And we have, let's say we have a program that takes some input, does something, and returns some output. And this is almost what every program in the world looks like. If it didn't look like this, then it would take some input and then don't do any output at all. And that would be kind of useless. Or it would be that it didn't take any input and produces some output. And that can't be anything else but a random generator. Now, random generators do have their uses, but it's rather limited, let's say. And with input here, it could be anything, thank you, data that a user types in, or reading from a file, or, or reading from a database, or getting something from a HTTP call. And the same with output could be writing to a database or presenting something on the screen. And almost every program in the world looks like this, if you look at it from a mile high. And this looks like a function to me not like an object. That might be just me. Uh, now, if we have a problem that's too hard to solve, what do we do? As engineers, what do we do? Well, we split it into smaller problems. And then we solve those smaller problems. This means that we could take the x input, do some part of the problem solving with it to arrive some intermediate result, like t here. And then we do another function on it to get the final result. This means we can have one function f that takes x as input and produces t. And then we have another function g here that takes t as input and produces y, the real result we wanted. If we want to put those together, we would have to call g with the result of f. So first call f with the input, then take the result and give that to g, and then we will have the final result. This is a so common pattern that there really is an operator for that. It's the composition operator. So we have f. And the result from f is fed into g. I will give you an example of this. We say we have f that takes an int as a param parameter and returns a float. 
the implementation is just to convert the int to a float, add free to it, and that will be what will be returned from this function. Then we have g that takes a float as input and returns a bool. The implementation of g is just to compare it if it's bigger than four, this will yield true or false. Now, if I want to compose these two functions, I could say that h is a function that takes an integer and returns a bool. And I can implement this function by just composing f and g because the, re, the return value of f is a float and the input value of g is also a float. So I could put them together like two pieces of Lego, just compose them and we're done. Now, if I call h with a value, I will get a bool back. So if I coach call h with zero, I will get false back. If I call h with 10, I will get true back. And this is the way we build our programs as functional programmers. We split the problem into smaller pieces, then we compose them back together to solve the big problem. There are a lot of functional programming languages. Elm is one, I've just seen some code of it. And as I said, this compiles to JavaScript and you can run it in the browser. Uh, we have, for example, f -sharp, which is a .NET language. It runs on the CLR. Uh, Elixir is one. It's dynamically typed. And it runs on the Erlang VM. So if you have something that, that takes a lot of multi-threading, then Erlang VM and Elixir should be something you should look into. Uh, we have Clojure, which is a Lisp dialect with, that runs on Java. Scala is one. It's really an object-oriented functional hybrid, but you could call it a functional language if you want. Uh, it runs on the JVM. Kotlin is also a functional object-oriented hybrid that also runs on JVM. Then we have Go, which is a functional language, more or less. And we have Haskell. Haskell is a purely functional uh, language. It has no implementation or no interoperability with any object oriented at all. Uh, there are more languages out there, but this is there's this is a list of some of the more common ones. And you have already seen some Elm code, but the Elm runtime this works like this. You have a model, your state, your data. And then you have a view function that takes your data and turns it into HTML. And that HTML is then rendered by the browser. And then you have an update function, a function that transform your state together with a message from the browser. A mes message might be the user click the button, the user type some data, or an HTTP call came back from the browser, from the server with this data. So the message is something that will influence. And you take the message and your data and create new data, your new state. That's what the update function do. Then you feed that into the view function again, and you get new HTML that's, that is rendered by the browser again. And round and round we go. And if you are a front-end developer, I highly recommend looking into Elm because it's really great where you don't have any runtime errors because those errors are already caught by the compiler. So look into this if you are a front-end programmer. If you are a back-end programmer, especially if you are on the .NET stack, I highly recommend looking into F Sharp. F Sharp and Elm are quite similar in their syntax. They are not the same, but they are, are quite similar. And in F Sharp, 
we use the left keyword to define our functions. And here I have a function called square. It takes one input parameter. The compiler will figure out what the, sorry, what the types are. So in F sharp, we often don't have to explicitly declare what the types are. The compiler can figure it out for us. So don't think that F sharp is a dynamic language with dynamic types because it's not definitely not. Here's another another example. We have a function read value that takes unit as its input. It prints enter value to the screen. It then reads the console and converts that to an integer. And the last line of a function is the return value. This means that the last line is an integer expression. So this function returns integer. And its input is unit. So this is no question about it. what this is. This is a function that takes unit and returns end. We don't have to explicitly declare it. The, the compiler figure that out. figures that out for us. And here's another function write result. It takes an input x. And what it does, it just prints result to the screen. And here I have used percentage i, which means print an integer. This means that x must be an integer. And the print function always returns unit, because there's no value to return when you print it to the screen. So this is a function that takes an int as input and returns unit. There's no question what it, it can't, can't be anything else. So the compiler figured that out for us. We don't have to explicitly declare the types. Now, if the compiler can't figure it out, we can declare the types if we want to, or then we must. But often, if you look into an F sharp program, there are seldom used any type declarations in, in the functions. Now, one of the power of a functional programming language is piping. Uh, if you think of a Unix bash or a command shell, you can create, a, run a command, and then you can pipe that result to another command. And you can do the same in PowerShell on Windows and, and a, a lot of other command line interpreters. And you can do the same in F sharp, and you can do it in Elm as well. Here we have the read value function. We call it with unit. And the result of that function is piped into the square function. And the result from square is piped into write result. So this one line of code, it reads the value, it squares it, and it writes it to the result. It writes the result. If I want to do, to do this with an imperative language, then I would have to, to introduce some variables. I would have to have an int value that I read, read value, assign it to the value, then square that value and assign it to result, then write the result. So I have to introduce some temporary va variables that I really don't care about, because after this write result is done, I could throw away those values, the value and result variables. They are not important anymore. I can, of course, do this with a one-liner like this, but then it's backwards. Ah, right result. I call the last function first. I have to have a stack in my head to go down the stack, right result, square, read value. Ah, yeah, here's the bottom. We read the value. We square it, and then we write result. It's like backwards. I think the F sharp version where the pipe is much, much easier to understand because we read the value, we square it, we write the result. Whereas in the, the thing underlined where we do it backwards is strange. Functional program patterns. 
just as we have object-oriented patterns to solve certain problems, we have some functional program patterns as well. And one of those is that we like to make illegal state unrepresentable. And this means that we won't have data that is invalid. An example, let's say we have a customer type. And a customer is just something with an email and a flag that says whether this email is verified or not. And there is a problem with this. We don't want that. We could have a customer where email is garbage, but the it's verified flag is still true, or vice versa where the email is correct, but the ver is verified is false. And then we have some run into problem. Instead, we want to do like this, where we have a potential customer with an email string. And then we have another type that is verified customer with a verified email. So we will have one function that takes a potential customer and returns a verified customer. And then all over, when you ever need to do something with the customer, you take a verified customer as your input. Then you don't ever have to check the is verified flag or, or anything like that. Just, well, if it's a verified customer, then it is correct, always. Another example of this would be, let's say we have a contact and the contact is a name an email and a phone number. Now we have a business rule that says a contact must always have email or phone or both. Okay, you can do that like this. And this is F sharp, by the way. And in F sharp, the maybe monad is called option, but it's really the same thing. If we would implement this in Elm, it will look like this. We have a name, an email that's maybe email address, and phone that's maybe phone number. They, these two are equivalent. It's the same thing. The left is F sharp, the right is Elm. Now, the problem with this is that we could create data. We could create a contact that has nothing as email and nothing as phone. Well, that breaks the business rule. We don't want that. Instead, we would declare the data like this. We create a type contact info that is just like an enum. It's email only with an email address attached. It's phone only with the phone number. It's email and phone with email and phone number. It's always one of these three cases. Now we can't create illegal data. We can't create a case where there is no phone and no email because that doesn't exist. And there are several advantages with this. One is that, as I said, we can't create data that does not fulfill our business rules, meaning that once I have a contact info, I can be 100% sure that it is valid. I don't have to do input validation in all my functions to, to see that the contact info is correct. It is, because you can't create data that is not. That simplifies a lot. I don't have to do any input validation in my functions. Of course, I will do, have to do it once somewhere to create the data if I take some input from a, from, a, from a user and then validate it. If it's correct, then I create the contact info. All over, and that's only one and one time only. Another advantage of this is that you must always handle all cases. Let's say that we create a function that will send email to our customers. Then we take the contact info and yeah, if it's email only, we use the email address. If it's email and phone, we also use the email address. But if it's phone only, 
we can't forget to handle that case because the compiler will require you to handle all cases. So the phone only case, what do we do then? Yeah, well, maybe we should send a text message instead, or maybe it's okay to just ignore those customers that doesn't have an email. That's up to you, but you cannot forget to handle that case, which means your program will be more correct. Also, another advantage is that the business rule that says we must have email, phone, or both is documented right here in the type. I don't have to look into the code and go uh, finding if there's an if statement somewhere that verifies uh, the data or something. You can't create invalid data. It's right here and it's documented. Huge advantages. Another pattern, and here we go back to the object-oriented world. The active record pattern is hopefully known to most of you. It is a pattern where we have, for example, a class user, which has some data, an ID, an email, a name, a phone number, or whatever. And this class also have some methods. In this case, it's methods to update and create and delete the user from the database, which means this user object knows how, how to create and modify itself in the database. Perfect example of an object-oriented pattern. Well, there is some problems with this. It easily leads to problems because, oh yeah, we need more functions. We need more functionality. We need to, to be able to send emails to the customers. Okay, then we add a send email function or method to this class. And then a while later, we, oh yeah, we need to verify credit cards for the users as well. And then we need that data function and that and the, this class grows and grows and becomes a God object or oh, breaks all the rules of single responsibility and so on. So don't do that, please. Just leads to problems. Instead, as object-oriented programmers, we do the service pattern. And the service pattern is that, is that we have the class user with its data. And then instead we have services that operate on the user. We have a database service or a user repository that knows how to create or update or delete users from the database. And we have an email service who knows how to send emails to users. Now, take a look at this. What is this? This is functional. We have data and functions that operate on that data. We separate those two. Now, if the object-oriented pattern was bad or easily led to problems, and this service pattern is a better one, then could someone please explain to me why we are clinging to object-oriented languages? Wouldn't a functional language be a better fit when implementing a functional pattern? That's what I think anyway. Now, moving on. Another pattern that we have in functional programming is an impure M sandwich, or an impure, pure, impure sandwich, also called. And this works like this, that we, we want pure functions as much as possible, and as little as possible of the impure. But we must have those impure functions. So what we do is that we first do the impure functions. We call the database, we read the files, we get the input. Then we call the pure functions to operate on that data. We do the calculations, we do the decisions. And when we finally reach a result, we call another impure function to store that result. Write it back to the database or send it to the screen or whatever. So we want as much 
good stuff, the pure thing in the middle here, and as little as possible of the impure, but we must have it. And that means this, this looks like a sandwich where we want as much good stuff as possible and as little of the boring bread as possible. And this is called an impurium sandwich. You will might, might see this if you start using programming, functional programming. Now, functional programming style. You can do functional programming style with an object-oriented language. You could do immutable data. It's quite possible. You could do that. Uh, you can handle and have functions as first class citizens. And you can do declarative style with, for example, link. And with the new nullable reference types in C sharp 8, it gets better. It, it doesn't get rid of the null, but it's a bit better anyway. There, beware, there are still some pitfalls and gotchas with nullable reference types. But if you do this, it will take a bit of an effort. Immutable data is not by default in, in object-oriented languages. You have to consciously do that with purpose. And functions as first-class citizens, if you pass around functions as parameters and uh, or return functions, which by the way is called higher order function, that is a function that takes another function as a parameter or returns another function is called a high order function. If you do that in an object oriented language, you will quite fast run into problems because the declarations of types get a bit messy really quickly, actually. So I would say that you should use a functional program language instead. So why would you use a functional programming language? Because it's concise. It creates a lot less lines of code. We have seen that the, the maybe monad, for example, took me one line of code to declare in Elm whereas I would have to do at least five lines of code in an object-oriented language. And it's convenient. It's easy to create complex types, like the, the contact info I showed you. And it's also correct with the types and no null references. This means that the, your program will be more correct. There will be less bugs. I'm not saying that functional programming doesn't have bugs, because we, of course we do, but a certain category of bugs just goes away. They don't exist in a functional programming language, which means a functional program is more correct. Also, concurrency, as I've said, is easier. You don't have to have locks and, and mutex and, and other stuff to, to share data between your threads. And it also is complete. With Elm, you can use any other JavaScript language or, or package out there. It interrupts with Elm. The same with f -sharp. You can use any NuGet package from f -sharp. And you can create NuGet packages from f -sharp that can be used in c -sharp. So it is a complete language. So there's nothing really stop you from, from using functional programming languages. Now, how would you do to go about that? Well, you have to learn it, of course. Experiment with it, evaluate it, and, and do it again. Learn some more, experiment. That, there's, that's the only way to do it. How would you then do if you want to use functional programming in your daily work. First, you must have a champion. You must have an advocate, someone who is willing to push for functional programming. It won't happen by itself, so push for it. 
also you should start small. Don't say, oh, we're going to rewrite the whole system in F sharp. Don't do that. Only leads to problems. Start small. Take one little corner of your system or one little component or something and fix a problem. Just don't rewrite something that already, already works because that won't give you much value. Fix a problem, something that doesn't work or, or something that is lacking in, in your system. And write code, then talk and discuss and reason about it. Show it to your colleagues and talk about it. Compare it to other solutions and spread the knowledge. And both Elm and f -Shop communities are very friendly. So if you don't hesitate, if you get stuck or have some questions, so, so reach out. There are a lot of people out there who are more than willing to help. So conclusion, yes, functional programming is different from object orienting. And just by learning the functional programming will be, make you a better developer, even if you're still using object orienting in your daily work, because functional programming will make you see things from another angle. And seeing thing, things from more than one angle cannot be anything than good. And yes, the threshold for functional programming is a bit high. It takes some effort to learn it. But as Mr. Roosevelt once said, nothing worth having comes easy. So thank you for listening. I hope you found this inspirational. And if just one of you is now inspired to, to go out and start using functional programming, then I would say that this talk was a total success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, it's great to hear you. After a while, at least, I managed to do that. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, <laughs> it's great to have technical difficulties, but uh, I'm glad it was me and not you that had them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so um, we have some questions for you. Um, yes. So uh, is it right to think that functional programming is more suited for data processing uh, and objective for working directly with I.O.? And what are your thoughts uh, in regards to this? Uh, I wouldn't say that, that the functional programming is not suitable for I.O. Uh, of course, you can use it for, for anything, but sh sure, the functional programming shines at most when it's just data processing you're doing, yes. Of course, you can do everything. You can do UI in, in F Sharp or anything else as well. Elm is a UI language. So I wouldn't say that, no, not sure. Some problems is better solved with mm. functional programming than others, yes. Mm. Um, could you say a few words about performance specific to functional programming? Um, for example, does uh, instantiating new objects put a burden on the garbage collection? Do you have any thoughts about it? Uh, yeah, there will be some performance hit, yes. As you don't modify data, you create new, and that means you will, will consume more memory. But you won't consume as much as you think, because data copying always are shallow copies. You only have to copy, uh, create a new data of the really changed one. The other data can still point to the, the old data structures. Uh, so it's uh, less than you think at first. But yes, there will be some performance hit, but that is not significant uh, in my experience. OK, uh, another question here. Uh, would you say that F sharp uh, with the mono and the new C sharp core is an option even to an old new slash Linux grumpy guy like me. Yes, of course. <laughs> so there should be no fear in trying it out. No, no, try it out. Even if you 
won't use it in your daily work, just knowing about it and have tried it out and looked into it, as I said, that will make you a better object-oriented developer as well, because you have seen things from another angle. Hmm. Do, you have any do you have any recommendation on how to, what would be a good problem to start looking into and how to try? Uh, a common problem to look into is something like a um, data import-export function that is a side function to, to your main system. Uh, okay, we need to do a, a data export for uh, sales want some data for the last year and we need some data. Okay, let's write a functional program that gets its data and format it so the sales can, can use it in Excel. Mm -hmm. Something like that that doesn't disrupt your, your normal system or uh, just some side side effects of your system, if you say. That's a typical way of start using it. Okay. That was uh, all the questions that we had today. So uh, I say thank you for this presentation. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking time to reply to the questions. Um, I'm once again sorry for the very interesting uh, introduction. It's uh, fun because I have uh, phone calls several times per day and the only time it doesn't work is when you're live in front of a lot of people. <laughs> of course. Guess I didn't pray hard enough to the demo gods. <laughs> 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 um, but we usually do the two truths and a lie with the speakers. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I'm curious uh, if you want to do it as well, uh, okay. even though Just, we... Uh, sure even though I won't have as much time to think about it. <laughs> mm. So uh, do you have um, two truths and a lie to tell me? Yes. Uh, three statements about me where some of them are actually true is that I have competed in motorcycle racing. I have competed in downhill skiing. And I have competed in uh, rifle shooting. Okay. Yeah. Do you strike me as a rifle shooting guy? Yeah, maybe you do. Yeah, I, I think that you haven't competed in uh, downhill skiing. Then you would be wrong. Damn it. <laughs> Which I one haven't do... you competed in? Uh, motorcycle racing. I do oh. own a motorcycle and I have done quite a few training laps on, on the raceways here in Sweden, but I haven't actually participated in a race. I see. <laughs> so that part wasn't entirely true. No, it was a, a trick question, maybe. <laughs> trick question, almost, yeah. <laughs> Great. But I am a trickster, so. <laughs> so, um, well... Thank you once again, and thank you for all who uh, participated in this. Um, as I said in the beginning, we have two more sessions coming up before the summer break. Uh, and next week, uh, as I also said, I won't be here, but you will be, um, the stream will be hosted by Andreas Hedeström. Um, but there will be one familiar face, actually, because for next week, um, Per Ökvist will return to give another talk. Um, this time about introduction to Dapper, uh, which, by the way, is not Dapper, the ORM, but uh, distributed application runtime. Uh, so uh, I will not see you next week, but you will still be here, I hope. So uh, bye all and take care. Bye. So easy.